All right, so today, the last Sunday of the year, and uh, normally around New Year's, we, we make resolutions, don't we? I mean, I don't make them anymore because I can't, one, I can't remember what my resolutions are and uh, after a few days, and two, I just can't keep them. And you know, researchers tell us that most people who make resolutions, the vast majority, after about two weeks, they stop doing them anyway. They just give up on it because whatever they, their resolution was, it's too difficult and they quit. And most people by month just have, have done away with them completely. So I'm not going to talk about resolutions today. I'm not going to talk about things you need to do or things that would be good to do or, or things like that. What I want to talk about is what does it mean to have new life in Christ? That's the title today, New Life, New You. Because it's a new year, new year, new life, and all of that. And we are new creations in Christ. And so because of that, there is a response that we have every day that we live. Every day that we live should be about living out the new creation that we are. So we shouldn't have to, to resolve to do that. It should be a natural and normal part of who we are to live out of our newness. The Apostle Paul in, in 2 Corinthians talked about this. And he's talking about how the church at Corinth, how they should live in their newness of life. That the old is gone and the new has come. And he wants them to understand it. And so I want to pass that along to you today. The passage we're going to look at, it breaks down really well into four parts. And so the first part is where Paul says, to love, the love of Christ controls us. Some translations say the love of Christ compels us. But I like the way this one says it. So 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, beginning in verse 14. The love of Christ controls us because we know that one person died for everyone. So all have died. He died for all so that those who live would not continue to live for themselves. He died for them and was raised from death so that they would live for him. What Paul says there really echoes in many ways what Jesus said in, in John's gospel on that last night of his life. It's, it's our theme here, isn't it? One of the things that we talk about all the time is to do what? Love as? As, as he loved us, right? I mean, that was part of the new command that he gave in John's gospel. Part of the new covenant was that we're going to love as he loves us. And so now Paul is saying here in, to the Corinthian church, let love be the thing that controls you. Not just an emotion, but the love of Christ, which is an action. Let that be the thing that controls your very life. Everything that we do should be because of and for the love of Christ. And because of that, our focus should not be on ourselves. Our focus should be on others. That's the whole focus of Jesus' love was not on himself, but it was displayed in what he did for us. And the reason that we can do this is because of what Jesus did. Paul said that Jesus died for all. Because Jesus died for all, it means that all are worthy. It means that all are valuable. It means that all have worth. And because if everyone has worth, those who believe and even those who don't, then doesn't it behoove us to let his love compel us in how we relate and respond to other people? So we don't live from selfish motives, but we live for others. And you know, this time of year... I know you've seen the stories. There are lots of stories on the internet and on the news about either movie stars or athletes. They'll go into like a Walmart and they'll pay off all, their, all the leadway for people, right? There was one guy in Memphis, I think. Somebody paid like $70,000. Uh, another one of my favorite athletes played at the University of Alabama, was, it, it plays for Nashville, the Titans, and he went into a Walmart and paid $10,000 for people for their leadway so they could get their leadway. And those are the things that really it warms our heart when we see people doing that, right? That caring for their fellow human being. And so those are good stories. But Paul, Paul says that should not be the exception. That we do good for other people should not be the exception. It should be the norm. It should be the thing that we do all the time. Not necessarily paying off railway. You understand what I'm saying. But as we respond and relate to other people... It should be because Christ's love is the thing that controls us. It is his love that compels us to care for others. It is his love that calls us to go to Brazil several times to care for the people down there. It's his love that is compelling us to go to Appalachia this May to care for the people there. It's his love that causes you to give to different organizations. 
so that they can care for other people. You see, his love must be the thing that compels and overpowers and controls everything that we do. We should let his love displayed on a cross and an empty tomb control how we see other people. Which leads us to the reason we should do that is because we're new. <coughs> Continuing in that chapter, he says, From this time on, we don't think of anyone as the world thinks of people. It is true that in the past we thought of Christ as the world thinks, but we don't think that way anymore. When anyone is in Christ, it is a whole new world. The old things are gone suddenly. Everything is new. Now that's not just some beautiful passage that he says that everything is new and the old is gone but in essence what Paul is saying there is that when we come to faith in Christ when he redeems us he makes us new we are new creations that's a substantive change within us it isn't just a religious statement to say I've been born again or I've accepted Christ certainly it is that but it's so much more because when Christ comes to live in us he does make us new he gives us a new heart a heart not of stone, but a heart soft for other people. He gives us a new nature, not a sin nature. He takes that old Adam nature away, and he puts in a new nature. He exchanges our old for a new, and he makes us new. He makes us holy and righteous. He makes us his own, his sons and daughters, as we saw last week. We are now adopted into his family, and we're new. We're his. Now, here's the thing about that, though. Because we are substantively new, our minds haven't been changed, all right? Salvation is a complete change, exchange of our heart from, from dead to alive, but our minds have to be renewed. In fact, Paul said, renew your minds daily. Let the things of, of the scripture and of his spirit be the thing that renews you every day. Paul, writing to the Philippians, said this. He said, brothers and sisters, continue to think about what is good and worthy of praise, Think about what is true and honorable and right and pure and beautiful and respected. Now, all of these things have to do with what? Our thinking, right? All of these things, he says, think about what is good and worthy of praise. Think about what is true, honorable, right, pure, beautiful, respected. How often in our society today do we see that occur? Not very often. You know, if you get on Facebook, especially around political debate, you don't see a whole lot of things that are pure and worthy of respect and trustworthy and all of those things and honorable. We don't see many of those things. It's as if the world controls us when it comes to the, those sorts of things. But he says we're a new creation and we're not of this world anymore. We're in this world, but we're not of it. We do not have to operate on the way the world operates. Our thoughts and our actions do not have to reflect the world around us. That means that we act differently and we think differently because we are learning and growing every day into this new life that he's given us. It's kind of like a child. When your baby's born, that baby has everything it needs to live. It's got hands and feet and arms and legs and brain and all the vital organs, everything. But that baby can't walk. That baby can't talk. That baby can't feed himself or herself. But as they grow, they're able to do those sorts of things. And as they grow, they can walk and talk and they can say no and they can do all sorts of things. They can, you know, they grow, they learn. I mean, look at every one of us. We were all babies once. We might all still act like babies, but we're all grown physically. All right? So, you know, we've grown. Why did we grow? Because that's the natural and normal progression of people who are alive. That's how we know someone is alive as they continue to grow. So what happens in the spiritual life is no different. We grow as a natural and normal process of being in Christ. As we think of these things, the things that are worthy and, and uh, honorable and worthy of praise and good and right and pure, beautiful, respected, those things and many more, as we think of those things then we grow. We grow spiritually. We let our brain catch up with our heart. We're new on the inside, but our brains have to be renewed. Our thinking has to be renewed, and that's a daily process. I saw a video, and maybe you've seen it too, about this man who was given these special glasses 
and he was colorblind. And he, his family gives him the glasses, and they take him outside, and they have him unwrap, and he puts the glasses on, and he looks, and he immediately pulls them off. And then he puts them back on. And he pulls them back off. And then he puts them back on, and he's crying because his world had been gray. But now it was in vivid color. And he was overwhelmed by seeing the colors that we take for granted. That's what life in Christ is like. It can be overwhelming to understand and recognize all of the things that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And it's like taking those glasses on, putting them on and taking them off a little bit, but keeping them back on so that we can begin to fully appreciate and can fully begin to understand the overwhelming nest of God for us. And that's what we have to do. The life of grace is unnatural at first. I wish I'd just let him back in. <laughs> All right, we're out. Okay, so <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so easily distracted. Uh, think about the messages that the world sends us. Think about the messages of this world. Things like live only for yourself. Get everything you can get. If it feels good, don't deny yourself. If you want it, get it. If you want to do it, do it. Whatever it is. But you see, the message of the world is antithetical to the way of Christ. The way of the world is antithetical to the mind of Christ and the heart of Christ. And we have to understand that. The newness we possess is a life lived for the good of other people. It's not just for our pleasure. That's why we must allow the Holy Spirit to renew our minds on a daily basis. We never arrive. Think about that. We never arrive. We are continually, daily, until we die, our minds are being renewed by the Holy Spirit. That's why we have to follow the Spirit every day. Without it, we'll never know the difference between the messages of the world and the Spirit. And we'll never truly know what joy and happiness are in this life until we are led and by the Spirit. But then our newness results in the next point Paul makes, that we have been reconciled. He says, all this is from God. Through Christ, God made peace between himself and us. And God gave us the work of bringing people into peace with him. I mean that God was in Christ making peace between the world and himself. In Christ, God did not hold people's guilt, people guilty of their sins, and he gave us this message of peace to tell people. So we have been, have been sent to speak for Christ. It is like God is calling to people through us. We speak for Christ when we beg you to be at peace with God. Christ had no sin, but God made him become sin so that in Christ, we could be right with God. Now that word peace, another word for that, depending on your translation, would say reconcile. Be reconciled to God. Be at peace with God. Before we were in Christ, we were at war with God. He was our enemy. We were his enemy. We were at war. But everything and everything we did was against him. But then, as we know, at the right time, Christ came. And Christ came to be our peace. Christ came to to bring the division between us and God. He came to remove that. He died for our sins so that every human being could have sin forgiven when they trust in Christ. And then he rose so that we could have real life. God did it for us. We could not do it for ourselves. You could not reconcile yourself to God. You were dead. There was, it was an impossibility, yet God did it for you. He made us alive in him. In fact, Jesus' death brought reconciliation with God. So because we have been reconciled to God, we have a ministry of reconciliation. We are to call people to peace with God. That is our responsibility. God gave the Great Commission. Go and make disciples, right? That is a call to peace. That is a call to reconciliation. It is the love of Christ. It is the love we have for Christ that we do this. The forgiveness that we received from him and the new life that he gave us, well, that should cause us to want others to have what we have. The world we live in is becoming more and more hostile to Christians. I just read an article this week about Christians, in, and I forget the country, that were beheaded by ISIS. Uh, and, and all the radicalism in our world is anti-Christian and anti-Christ. But here's the thing. 
I do not think that the message of reconciliation is a message that people are fearful of or have hatred for. Christians for far too long have pushed moralism rather than Jesus on people. And I'm for being moral. I think we should do right. I think we should act appropriately. I think we should care for people. We should always be truthful and honest and all of those things. We should be the most moral people there are. But no one needs another religion, but everybody needs Jesus. And that's the point that Paul is making here. Go out. Share the love of Christ because people need that. Christians are per perceived to be judgmental rather than loving. And that's not just a perception. That's a reality for so many. Or our actions are looked upon with suspicion because they think we want something from them. You see, we, we go and help people. We go to, to the homeless shelter. We do whatever we do. And people are suspicious because they think we're just goody-goodies doing something to help people. But really... They just can get something from us or we want something from them. But that's not the gospel. We love people no matter what. And we do it from a humble heart filled with love, the love of Christ. Why? Because we are at peace with God. We are reconciled with God. We will never be at war again with God. Do you realize that? That once that treaty was signed through the blood of Jesus Christ, you are now at peace forever, for all eternity, that nothing can separate you from that? And if that's the reality of how we live, isn't that the reality of what we should be sharing with others? And the reason we should share it is because of what Paul says next. He talks about salvation. He says, we are workers together with God, so we beg you, don't let the grace that you receive from God be for nothing. God says, I heard you at the right time, and I gave you help on the day of salvation. I tell you that the right time is now. The day of salvation is now. Paul begs us to not let the grace that we have received be for nothing. And what does he mean by that? He means by that is don't let the grace that you have been given in Jesus Christ just be for you without sharing it. The grace that you've, been, that you've received is for you, and it, that's great, but it will go for nothing if you never share it. If you just try to keep it all to yourself, it will be for nothing. What we have is so great, so extravagant, so reckless that we should want to share it with everyone so that they can have what we have. This past week, as we've talked about and sing about, we celebrated Jesus' birth. This is the greatest gift that anyone could ever give, God becoming one of us. But he gave, God gave, so that we could give. He gave his one and only son so that we could receive, but in our receiving, we give. He says, so, there is no better time to receive this gift of grace than today. You see, I don't know your hearts. I don't know where you stand with God spiritually. But I do know that Paul says today is the day of salvation. If you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, let me tell you, it's not hard. I mean, it may create some problems in your life when you start to live for Christ. But here's the thing. There is no special prayer. There's no posture you have to get into to accept Christ. Paul said that salvation is belief in Jesus Christ. That's what salvation is. And so if you've never trusted Christ, trust him today. Let today be your day of salvation. Let to this new year coming up be the, the year when you began to recognize your newness. And begin to live out of that newness. And if you are a believer, if you recognize and have received that grace, then you're at peace with God. You're a new creation. Therefore, let the love of Christ control everything you, knew, you do. It's a new year, and you're a new you. All because of what Christ did for you. So what I want you to do, this is not a resolution. It's a command. Go out from this place and every day, one, give thanks to God for your newness. That you're at peace with him. Your actions will never change that because it's not about you, it's about him. And then be committed to sharing the love that he has poured into your heart with other people. Don't let the grace you have go for naught. Don't just take it upon yourself and say, well, I've got it and I'm not going to share it. 
Because as we've learned from what John said, God's grace is grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Grace upon grace upon grace. It never ends. And so you can never outgive God. And this isn't even a stewardship sermon. <laughs> but <laughs> but <laughs> I'm sorry. But it is about how we live because we're a new creation. Every day is a new day. Every day is a new opportunity. Every moment is an opportunity for us to live out what we have. So I want to encourage you to do that. Let this be a great year as we focus on the new. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for this newness you've given us, that you poured your love into our hearts, and you didn't just put a little drizzle and a little dab into our hearts, but you poured it in there. And you never unpour it, and you just keep pouring it into our hearts because you want us to lavish it on others. Lord, you have lavished your grace upon us. And let us never take it for granted. Never let us think that this life is just routine or boring or whatever. But let us realize that we are your ambassadors and that we have an opportunity to share this great love that you poured into us with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.